or the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord. It's sort of the, the focus that we're going to have when we come into Psalm 119, and we're just going to spend a, a couple of Sundays here, not go through the entire thing. And Jeremiah, one of the most amazing verses, when I came across this passage some time back, was such an encouragement to me and a challenge to my life to have this theocentric view of the world and life, right? And the most treasured thing that we can have is a knowledge of God, and this is what Jeremiah celebrates. And ultimately, we're going to find this in Psalm 119, but we're constantly reminded in Scripture that God is God, and that He is the highest object, the highest good, and He is the highest of value. And we are going to celebrate this in the next few weeks, but I wanted to bring you to Psalms 119, and, and we're going to look at the first eight verses. Um, we're going to look at the purpose of Revelation and then what our response to Revelation should be, and that will come later. We're only going to look at the first part. But by way of introduction, the Psalter, there was a quote I read, and I can't remember who said it, but I just have to acknowledge it's not mine. But it, the statement was this, the Psalter is an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. Now the point of the author when they said this was not that the soul can be divided up in a whole bunch of different parts. The, the focus was on the fact that when you come to Psalms, there is not one emotion, affection that we can be conscious of that is not reflected somewhere in the Psalter. In other words, whatever you can go through in life, it's contained in the Psalms. From Psalm 1 to 150, there are the highs, highs, the low, lows. And what's interesting for me is that Psalm 119 does the same thing. It takes us on this journey with the psalmist, and he goes through all of these difficult times, times when he is in rebellion and he, he finds himself in affliction. But the lessons learned from that, there are times of great rejoicing and there's times of great sorrow. And his response to that is the, the key thing that I think is so important about this psalm. But we find that the Holy Spirit is going to deal with life. I mean, this is what he does through the Psalter, and he deals with all of the griefs, all of the doubts, all the sorrows, whatever it is that might plague our minds and hearts in life. The Holy Spirit deals with those things in the Psalter. So the reality of it is, is that when you come to the Psalms, you can find everything that you need for life found contained within these Psalms. And it was a journey for me a long time ago started, and I thank my father for this, but it is a part of my journey and continues to be a part of that. The older I get, the more I come back here because it constantly am being challenged in regards to life and how I should respond to that. Kylan Delich, in regards to Psalm 19, made this statement, the Christian's golden ABC of the praise, love, power, and the use of the Word of God. For here we have set forth an inexhaustible fullness that the Word of God is to a man and how a man is to behave himself in relation to it. And really that is, this, in a sense, what we're going to look at next time is how do we respond to this revelation given to us by God. But one of the things that I enjoy about the Old Testament is the, the element of the language. And I mean, this is part of the reason why I teach the language is Greek and Hebrew. I just love them. And it's, it's a love that professors have passed on to me Dr. Dave Duell, and then my father with Greek in that. And there are some key elements to Hebrew poetry, and we're going to talk about one specifically in regard to this psalm, but there are things that stand out about Hebrew poetry. And when you know this, actually, it opens up the scriptures to you. I remember I shared a little paper, thin paperback book with a brother. He was asking me, you know, he was going through Proverbs, and he says, and I was talking about the, the techniques of Hebrew poetry, and he says, is there a book I could read that would help me to understand how it works. And I said, yeah. And so I gave him this little paperback book and told him to read through it. And it just laid out some of the elements of Hebrew poetry. And he says, man, it just started opening up the Word of God to me, start to see these structures and how they thought and how they wrote. But two of the amazing things about Hebrew poetry is rhyme of thought and the other is rhyme of words. I remember that there was a, a, a professor and he was talking one time about Hebrew and he said, there is no rhyme and rhythm in Hebrew. And I was like, well, Yes, there is, man. And if you come to the Psalms, you will find that. The rhyme of thought, and this is one of the geniuses about Hebrew poetry, is that there is thought rhyme that runs through here, and really we find this in parallelism, where you have these corresponding thoughts to another. And there are different types of parallelisms that you can encounter within Psalms and also in Proverbs. 
But then you just realize that you can find this in other writers in the New Testament even because they are Jewish, most of them, right? And so they're writing, utilizing these techniques that they were raised in and grew up with. The other thing that's interesting about Hebrew poetry is rhyme of sound. And one of them is alliteration where you will have a similar letter that keeps appearing in the words that follow. And in this case, there are actually a couple of them. And, and the roots are very similar, and so there is this sound that keeps coming back to you. It's repetitive as you read through a psalm. And it's, it's a part of how Hebrew poetry is supposed to be. You aren't supposed to just read it and know it. You're supposed to experience it. So I remember the first time I took a class in Hebrew poetry, Dave Duell, and, and we were reading through these Hebrew poems, and one was about a snake. And it had the sheen and sheen all the way through that. But as you would read through it, you would hear this like the snake hissing as you would read this poem. And it was about experiencing it. There was something that in which all of you was involved in what you did when you read Hebrew poetry. The other is the acrostic. And this is what we have in Psalm 119. Acrostic uses the Hebrew alphabet. And there's different ways that this can be done. But it stands out in this one because in the Hebrew alphabet there are 22 letters. And most of your Bibles with each section will at least give you the name of the letter, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, and so on. NIV will actually give you the symbol for the consonant there for all of these sections. But it basically follows the Hebrew alphabet, and each section contains eight verses. And each line of these verses will begin with that Hebrew letter. So if you, if you looked at the Hebrew text, this is what you would see, that every single line of this first grouping of eight verses begins with Aleph. That is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now just think about that as, you're, as you think about the writer of this psalm. That's some serious labor, thought, and work, right? The, the reason for this is there are several reasons why this kind of device is used. First, it shows order. The other is that it shows progression, and it also shows completeness. We will see that if you look at Psalm 119, that is a part of this, and we'll come back to this in a moment, the idea of completeness. But it shows order and progression as well. So one of my favorite psalms, it's an acrostic, is Psalm 25. And it is an ABC psalm for a day of trouble is what I would title it. And what's interesting about that psalm is that it uses the Hebrew alphabet and it will begin. And so you'll go Aleph, Beth, and it'll start going down. Then all of a sudden that pattern will break. And then it'll go back to the pattern again of following the alphabet. And then it will break. And then it will go back to the pattern again. Well, what's the point? As you experience that psalm, not merely just read the content and understand it, but as you experience it, it is talking about how trouble enters your life. You have an order to your life. You have your patterns to your life. You have the things that you do, your routines, and then all of a sudden, bam, something enters your life. You weren't expecting it. It came unnoticed, right? And all of a sudden, you're blindsided by this trouble, this trial that you're in. And now how do you deal with it? Well, that psalm, Psalm 25, gives you principles on how to deal with those moments of trouble entering into your life. So there's a beauty to this, right? And, and unfortunately, our English translations don't capture all this, so my job is to help you know this. But this morning, I just want to look at one thing, and it is this, the, the purpose of revelation. And I want to look at the particular aspects of Psalm 19. We're just going to look at the words, but there is such great blessing that comes with God's revelation. This is how it starts. Twice we have this double blessedness in verse 1 and verse 2. How blessed are we. Great blessing in regards to God's revelation. He has given us a great gift. The fact that we can know Him, right? The highest good the highest of values, right? That the, the most amazing, most high God, and we can have this intimate relationship with Him through this. So the purpose of, the, of Revelation, verses 1 through 8, and, and this is interesting because I what started me on the journey of this particular psalm was that I wanted to have a biblical view of the Word of God. And I wanted to allow Scripture to shape my mind and how to understand the Word of God, how to see it. And there's some other things we'll come back next to next time and talk about in relation to this Psalter in regards to this particular psalm. But there was another aspect of my study. I went to the New Testament because I thought, you know, if I'm going to have a, a clear view of Scripture, then I would want to have Christ's view of Scripture. So I went through the New Testament, went through the Gospels, and I just asked myself the question, what is Christ's view of the Word of God? How does he see it? 
Because if that's how he sees it, that must be then how I should see it, right? So that is what brought me to Psalm 119, Psalm 19, and Psalm 1. They all deal with the same thing. They deal with the Word of God. Now, what's interesting is you walk through Psalm 119, you will notice as you just read through it and you, you give any kind of consideration as you're reading that there are eight to nine words that the psalmist is going to use. And he uses these terms. They will occur in 175 times in 176 verses. At least once in all, in every single verse, you will get a word for the Word of God. Now, we'll come back to this thought in a moment, all right? But just keep that in mind. So as he walks through this, he's going to lay out some terms for us. And I just want to look at those this morning. The first one is his law, the Torah. This is direction or instruction according to BDB. This is how they would define it. And we know this word it occurs 25 times in Psalm 119. Now, I give you these stats because we're going to come back to this in a little bit later and ask ourselves, what is the purpose of God's revelation, right? So 25 times Torah is used, and, and it has both a broad and a narrow meaning. In a narrow sense, it is the Torah of Moses. It is the Pentateuch, right? And usually when we read it, this is what we understand. And so oftentimes you will find the capital L to indicate this, right? The Torah of Moses is the first five books of the Old Testament. However, there's a broad sense to this term Torah, and it can be used in reference to just instruction. Whatever it is that flows from the revelation of God, and it is the basis for life and action. So so in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, it says, My son, do not forget or forsake your father's instruction and your mother's Torah, her teaching. Now, one translation, it's more interpretive than it is translation, renders it that, that instruction that you receive on your mother's knee. And I like that because there is a care and a love that comes with this idea of Torah. Oftentimes, it will reflect on the fact that God is Father, and He is the one who has given us instruction in regards to our life. So Zemeck, in regards to this term, he defines it this way. It depicts God's special revelation as a gracious gift which points out or shows the way through life's twisted highways and byways. It's divine revelation as a guide to life. So it's really interesting that we find it in the book of Proverbs pretty frequently, this word Torah for instruction or law. It is that which flows from the revelation of God. It helps us through life. The other word is testimonies. We find this in verse 2. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all of their heart. Now, we're just going to look at the terms that are used here by the psalmist. But testimonies is from eduth or edoth, and it's used 23 times. The singular is used in verse 88. It comes from et, which means to witness or to testify. And when it talks about the Word of God as the testimony of God or His witness, it affirms the fact that He is the one who reveals His nature, His attributes, His truth. He testifies about Himself. He bears witness as to who He is. He reveals to us or declares what His will is, and thus then come the demands consequent to that. But it's God's testimony about Himself. Now, this starts to open up the door for us a little bit in understanding the reason for revelation, the purpose that is behind it. And it views God as the source of absolutes. So the two go together, right? We see this in society. When you abandon absolutes, when you abandon God, you abandon the absolutes that go with God, right? Mm -hmm. Now everything's relative. It's only natural those two things rise and fall together. He is the source of absolutes. He is the source of universals. Wherever you go, these truths are consistent and they're binding for everybody wherever you go in the world. The world would say, no, it's just everything is relative. Whether you're here or you're in Germany or you're somewhere else, it all just depends on where you are and everything is relative. So it emphasizes the authority of the source and it also emphasizes the accountability of man to receive this from God. If he is the one who imparts these absolutes, then it is incumbent upon us to receive them, and we're accountable to receive these things. Now he uses eight or nine words. I'm going to say he uses nine. One of the points of question is this word here, his ways, verse 3. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways, dedek. I would suggest that this is also used through Psalm 119. As you read through it, you'll find it's used as another reference to the Word of God. 
and it has to do with describing the pattern of life, which is marked out by God's law. But what's important about this word is that it reflects his character. In other words, as God instructs in regards to life, your ways, as he imparts his ways to us, and they are to become our ways, in this he reflects his character. In other words, he desires his people to reflect his character in their lifestyle. So we hear such terms as statements as, be holy as I am holy, right? Or be merciful as your Father is merciful, as Christ exhorts us in the Sermon on the Mount. So with this revelation then, as God gives it, he reveals his character. This is the destructiveness of of legalism, one of the destructive elements of it. But it's a vital aspect of why we should reject any kind of legalism. The reason being is that with legalism, what happens is that the law becomes the thing and it's forgotten God. In other words, when you look at the Old Testament and when you see the Word of God, you understand that God and His Word go together. That when God speaks, He's revealing something about His character. So someone suggested to me that in a passage of Matthew talking about when Christ opened up and He said, you know, those who are weary and heavy laden, right? Take my yoke upon you. So they were talking about how God reveals His heart there. And it's the only place in all the Scripture that God reveals His heart. And I said, well, that's not true. There's a lot of places that God reveals His heart. There's a lot of places where God reveals his character and nature. And it isn't just that he states his attributes, but when you read through scripture, you see God do things, what he does manifests who he is. Right? So he doesn't need to necessarily give us an attribute in a context in which it talks about something that God is doing. God reveals himself by what he does. So therefore, this is the challenge to us, is that whatever we do in life, whatever we say, Whatever our lifestyle is, it must reflect his character. In other words, when people look at us and we declare to be children of God, when they look at us, do they see God in the things that we do? Otherwise, then our testimony is a little bit faltering, right? But this is the idea behind the term direct or ways. The other one is in verse 4, his precepts. So you have ordained your precepts, verse 4, that we should keep them diligently. And again, we'll come back next time and talk about how we should respond to this revelation. And I think it's crucial, so it deserves one message in and of itself. But this one is precepts, pikudim. This term is used 21 times in Psalm 119. And the thought of this word and the the meaning behind it, it's, it's whether it's oral or written, these declarations, right, they reveal what is expected of man. And what's suggested in the usage of this term precepts is that the word of God should be applied to all the minutia of life. In other words, there's nothing that falls within through the cracks, right, in our life when it comes to the word of God. It's pertinent to everything that we may face in life. This is why it's so amazing, Psalm 119, because the psalmist goes through all of these moments and experiences in life, highs, lows, everything in between. But all the way through here, you see him responding to the word of God and calling upon God to use his word to bring about desired effects in his life. Psalm 119, verse 25. Notice, my soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Verse 28, my soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. And all of these moments that he's going to have, the highs, the lows, whatever it is, that he's always going to reach out to the word of God. And that is going to be the thing in which he finds solace. But it isn't just the word, though. So this term, precepts, we go back to verse 4, it suggests that that the Word of God is applied to all the minutiae of life, whatever it is that we're going through. It also indicates the authority to determine a relationship between the speaker and the object, that God has every right to, to call upon us to live in a certain way, that He can give us these precepts and expect that we will carry them out and all the things that we go through in life. In other words, it views God as the definer of principles and duty. It's enough in life to live up to God's expectations. But isn't it interesting how often we burden ourselves with others' expectations as well? Sometimes we find ourselves giving that the priority in our life, trying to live up to, to other people's expectations of us as opposed to just living up to God's. And here's the reality of it. If we live up to God's expectations, <laughs> then we'll be right with everybody else. 
And if we're not, then it's not on us, right? If we're walking in his word. So it's a clear indication then that the authority of Yahweh can, can lay out these precepts and that their expectation is that man should submit. Otherwise, there's consequences. And the Old Testament reflects this. The other word we find in verses 5 and 8. Verse 5, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. And then verse 8 have the statement of resolve, I shall keep your statutes. But it is a statement of resolve that rests in reliance. I love verse 8. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. I can't do this by myself. So there is resolve, but it rests in and reliance upon God. So his statutes in verses 5 and 8. Hukim, this has the idea, verse 22, it's used 22 times in all of Psalm 119, but it comes from the root which means to cut in, engrave, or to inscribe. Now this is an interesting truth and a very powerful one about the Word of God. It's referred to something that is graven in rock for perpetuity, for something that is permanent, for a fixedness, or a changelessness. So this tells us about the nature of the Word of God, right? That it is, if you will, something that has been ordained, decreed, prescribed, or enacted, that there is an enduringness about the Word of God, whether it's revelationally or applicationally. In other words, that the Word of God is binding for all time. In other words, the Word of God is not a fad, in today, out tomorrow, but some in the church live that way. It's always relevant. It's the enduring Word of God. Why? Because it partakes of the very nature of God, right? He is eternal, thus His worth. His Word also reflects His eternality. So in Psalm 119, if you read further, Thy Word is written in the heavens, O Lord, forever. Forever. In other words, this helps us understand that God's Word is never outdated, God's Word is never out of touch, and God's Word is always relatable to our life. There are fads that come and go, and sometimes we find ourselves buying into them. And they're just the same old stuff, come back, repackaged, some new name, but it's the same old deception that Satan uses. The amazing thing is that when you cling to the Word of God, you realize that there is great stability. For as it says in the New Testament over and over, it stands written forever. <laughs> it's binding. It's for all time. His commandments... Mitzvah, I love this one, 22 times this word is used. And it has the idea of to set or to appoint, and it emphasizes the right to give orders. And what comes with this word is the idea of doing what you are told. It's an interesting word for us parents to reflect on. Because we often tell our kids, right, do what you're told. I've given you instruction, I've given you a command, right, do what you're told. But I always have to ask myself, how many times do I do what I'm told? It's easy for me to call that from my children, right? As a parent, that's what. But do I ever evaluate my own life in regards to my obedience? Do I do what I'm told? The other word is his righteous judgments, mishpat. I love this word. Verse 7. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart, and when I learn your righteous judgments, right? So there is this element of worship that is going to flow out of the understanding of these mishpatim. This term is used 20 times in Psalm 119. Now, I'm, I'm, again, I'm giving you the stats because we're going to come to a point in a moment in light of all of this. But this term could also be translated ordinances, and it relates to rules of righteous administration. This term arises from the verb to give judgment. In other words, it is that which makes a decision as to what is right and what is wrong. When we determine what is right and what is wrong in our life, where do we appeal for that? As people of God, it should be the book, and it should be the Word of God, and that should be that which dictates to us what is right and what is wrong. But sometimes our preferences creep in. Sometimes our own biases creep in. 
but the Word of God is given to us so that we might know what is right and what is wrong. And these furnish the basis then for Israel's legal system. In Psalm 119, it refers to the decisions made by God, and it views God as the supreme judge. If he says this is right, if he says this is wrong, he is the one to judge what is right and what is wrong, right? And ultimately, he's the one we answer to in the end of it all, in our great exit energy that we're all going to get. The other one, and I, I combine this, there are two of them, two words that, that are translated word, but they're two different words in verses 9 and 11. How can a young man keep his way pure by keeping according to your word? Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. So this word is important for us, but there's two words behind it. The first is davar. This occurs 23 times in Psalm 119. The other one is Imrah, and this occurs 19 times in Psalm 119. Both of them come from root words that have the idea of speaking. In other words, God communicates. So, Devar is the broad term for divine revelation, indicates the means by which God speaks to us, human language. It's such a marvel to me that, that God uses our language, right, to communicate Himself to us so that we can know Him. This is the amazing thing about God and, and all the things that He shares with us. One, He shares existence with us. He shares life with us. He shares love with us. And He shares communication with us. Right? So we have Valentine's Day coming. We get to express and communicate our love for our loves in our life. But God is sharing this ability with us. And it's such a joy that we can be able to open up His book and He speaks to us, right? Using human language. In the Old Testament, He used Hebrew because that was the language in which He was going to communicate to His chosen people. And then when it started to spread, the truth was going to impact the Gentile world. Then in Daniel, we have Arabic, right? Because this was the language of the people. It was the, the commercial language that was used by everybody. And so we get prophecies that are given in that language. And then we come to the New Testament and we have Greek. The lingua franca of the day. Whenever anyone in the Roman Empire wanted everyone to know something, they would communicate that truth in Greek because everyone spoke it and knew it. And God used these languages to communicate to you and I. That, to me, is awesome. And we know then that God's revelation isn't merely conceptual. In other words, it isn't about just merely the thoughts. It's the words that He used to communicate with. So some have talked about this in regards to inspiration, that the thoughts are inspired but not the words. I'm sorry, but you can't divide them up. How do you communicate thoughts? By words. And if you go to the New Testament and you seek to know Christ's view of the Word of God, what's interesting is how many times when Christ is having a discussion with religious leaders, He will cite Scripture, appeal to it, and sometimes His whole argument will hinge on a single letter. find that amazing because it tells me that even the, the minutest of details and the communication of this truth are important to God. The words matter, but so do the letters that make up those words. So this divine revelation isn't merely just conceptual, it's verbal. It's propositional. Now, I'll just let you chew on that for a while, but that's an important reality. Propositional truth from God. And I'll just say that these, these thoughts, they used to not be argued within the confines of the church. Infallibility, inerrancy, those, those were not discussions among believers. We all agreed on this. But now all of a sudden, in the last several years, we find it now a need to discuss these realities in the church and also the need to affirm propositional truth. So our God is a God then who speaks, and it is the possession of that verbal revelation that marks us off as uniquely being His people. We are to be people of the book. In Greek, that's what Bible means, the book. We are people of the book. And oftentimes we will say that we are, but then this is the challenge, and this will come in the next Sundays to follow. 
We, will, we might say and confess with our mouths that we are people of the book, but the question is, do we really live like that? Is the book the final appeal on everything? Everything. And are we willing that whatever it says, then I will believe what it says? Or will we pick and choose? Because sometimes we do that, right? Especially when it comes to Christ's teaching. Give to everyone who asks. Well, <laughs> right? There are times in which we might balk at this. So the thought then, the purpose of Revelation, why is Revelation given? The Holy Spirit clearly reveals to us not only in just the Word of God overall, but in Psalm 119, if you read it, the singular sufficiency of Scripture. Every single term that is used by the psalmist describes one aspect of this revelation. And if you look at all of them together, you realize the sufficiency of the Word of God. It covers everything. Even the precepts, the minutia of life, it covers everything. You mean it tells me what kind of toothpaste to buy? Not necessarily directly, but the principles that guide how you use your money. Yes. Yes. And if you want to have that discussion afterwards, I'll have it with you. But yes, these principles, they guide everything that we do. There is a need for the Word of God as you look at Psalm 19 and read it over the week if you would choose to. But you find that it is necessary in youth, in an age, in trial, in duty, in meditation, in the night, in public, in private, in prosperity, in adversity. There is a need for the Word of God at all times and in all situations. And the psalmist experienced all of these in Psalm 119. And he's constantly appealing to the Word of God. The Bible claims that God is unlimited in His knowledge and power. He is infinite. We are finite. And therefore, because God is not confined to this realm like we are confined to this realm, He has to condescend to us, and He does so by revealing Himself to us in His Word. And He uses all these different words to, to reveal truths and aspects about His Word and even truths and aspects about who He is and about His nature. So as C.S. Lewis observed, he says, When you come to knowing God, the initiative lies on God's side. If he does not show himself, nothing you can do will enable you to find him. Whether it's general revelation or revelation specifically in the Word of God, if God does not reveal himself, we don't know God. He must make himself known to us. And as you study the issue of revelation throughout Scripture, you will find this to be so. So God has revealed himself by revelation that is anthropic. He has communicated to us in human language in categories of thought and action that we would understand. Anthropomorphisms, anthropopathisms. There are things that, that, that are spoken of in regards to God. The finger of God. Well, God doesn't have a finger. But that's an anthropomorphism. He speaks in a way in which we might understand who He is. Why? Because He's infinite. We're finite. For us to even get a, a little bit of a grasp on who God is, He must condescend to us. It's the most amazing thing that this book sits on our shelf and we can take it and open it up and we can see God and hear God and read God, right? And reveal to us the truth of who He is and we can know Him. And if He hadn't done that, we wouldn't. <laughs> so back to this thought then that the psalmist utilizes eight to nine words, basic terms that occur 175 times in 176 verses. To add to the stats, here's another interesting thought. The word Yahweh, Lord, appears 24 times. The word God only once in verse 115. I find that interesting. <laughs> but here's what's really cool. There is 211 times in which your or you is used in Psalm 119. It's about a personal relationship with God. What's the reason for His revelation? is so that we can have a relationship with Him. He's the central figure of Psalm 119. He is the central figure of all of Scripture. Joshua isn't about Joshua, it's about God. Jonah is not about Jonah, it's about God. And yes, we do matter, and yes, we are significant. But here's the thing, God is not in the peripheral. God is not marginal. God is front and center and must be always. Man is in the peripheral in relation to God. 
So the purpose of this revelation then is so amazing because when you read through Psalm 119, you realize that the beauty of the psalm isn't just merely the recitation of the devotion to the law of God. It is about devotion to God. It isn't just love for the word for the word's sake. It's not some kind of legalism. God is not separated from the word. In other words, it is a means to an end. When I read his word, I find out about who he is. And my relationship with him grows deeper and deeper and deeper. It's about the relationship. So in all of the ups and downs that the psalmist faced in life, and he faced all kinds of them, he draws closer to his Lord through his word. Therefore, it's not just a psalm only about the law. It's about love. It's about his commitment and devotion to his God. The psalm is not only then about statutes, but about spiritual growth and strength. And the beauty of the psalm resounds in the relationship between the psalmist and his God, not simply just in a word. It's a means to an end. Yeah, I study Hebrew and Greek, and I continue to do it, and it's a lifelong pursuit for me. But it's a means to an end. The end is that I know my God, and I know Him well, and I have a relationship with Him. So next time we'll come back and look at what should be the proper response to this revelation. But I, I give you two thoughts, one by G.I. Packard. He said, once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. C.S. Lewis coupling on this, he says, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. <laughs> now as we close in a word of prayer.